how you all doing? I was visiting with the kings. You know, it's Christmas time. We've got to sing some Christmas songs, don't we? Yeah? Okay. We're going to sing a couple. So, <laughs> so why don't you all stand with me at least for one, okay? We're going to sing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. This is a reading from 1 John, and this is my favorite passage of scripture um, as a preacher. He's, he's talking about uniting in fellowship under the word, and he says, what was from the beginning, um, and he's talking about the gospel message, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning of the word of life, and that life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and we heard, we have proclaimed to you also, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. How beautiful a picture that is, that one of the greatest acts of fellowship we can do as brothers and sisters in Christ is to unite under the proclamation of the gospel. How wonderful that is, that with us being obedient to God's word and listening to it and learning from it and gleaning from it and preaching it well and listening to it well, we have fellowship with each other and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So I want to be the first to welcome you into that fellowship tonight and hopefully if RJ preaches a good message later, he'll continue that <laughs> fellowship. <laughs> and you guys are participating in the fellowship as well by taking this gospel home and living it out. So, Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for your good news, God, that you have sent your son to live the perfect life for us, God, and to die the perfect death for us and to rise again, defeating death, that we are no longer conquered by sin, God, but that we serve you ultimately. And I just thank you for that wonderful gift. I pray that as we gather together in fellowship tonight under your word and in lifting your name higher with praises, with singing and um, with prayer, God, that we would just keep you as our focus and as the forefront of our vision, God, that all of our actions tonight, though we know we present them from a meek and humble place, God, that you would exalt these gifts that we bring to you and that you would be exalted. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. RJ, I know you're going to preach a great message tonight, brother. I mean, he threw you right under the bus. He's fired. So, <laughs> this isn't a Christmas song, but I haven't sung it in a long time. I wanted to sing it. So we'll get to Christmas next, okay? I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. 
Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan Starts at me are hurled. My faith was caught, the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. And let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright but still I'll pray till heaven is found Lord lead me on to higher ground Lord lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than I have found Lord let my feet on higher Isn't that a great haunt hymn? We don't sing it very often. Hark the herald angels sing. This is a Christmas one, Grace. <laughs> Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconcile. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hailed incarnate, be it he, pleased as men with men to us our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn Keep their 
and praise and sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast loved, loved me, and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I'll love thee in life, I will love thee in death. And praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath. And say when the death lies cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright and singing thy praises before thee. Turn with me to 1 Peter this evening. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll uh, pick up in verse 1, read all the way down to verse 8. It says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, and coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice 
and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which, is, uh, which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. It's our great passage that we have this evening to, to dissect. We will probably just get to verses 4 and 5, although 6, 7, and 8 will go extremely quickly, and so we might squeeze those in, but who knows what the Lord has planned for us tonight. We'll just move right on along. So here's what we got, and here's one of the interesting things that we find ourselves digging through First Peter. If you remember, the, the year is uh, A.D. 64. Uh, what we have here is, is Nero is, has burned Rome, and he has blamed it on the Christians. And so it's not a safe place for the Christians any longer, and so they have scattered. And chapter 1 in the first verse tells us where they have all scattered to, but they, they are all scattered around into modern-day Turkey, and they are literally running for their lives, and they are scared. They're scared for for many reasons. One is they're scared of, of Nero. One is they're scared of persecution. They're scared of, of the what-ifs. How many of us have found ourselves wondering about the what-ifs, right? And we, we begin to allow our minds to wander to the what-ifs, and we need to, to capture our thoughts. If there's one thing that I've heard from Brother Mike over and over and over again as he has walked with Ruth through this, uh, through this situation, through this cancer with, with his wife, is something he has told me time and time again is that he holds captive his thoughts, that he doesn't allow them to wander. And that's what you and I are called to do. But, but they're running scared. They're, they're having all of these issues. And now they begin to do what you and I do, at least me. I guess I can't speak for you. But what we begin to do is we begin to turn against God. In the midst of our valleys, in the midst of, of all that's going on, all the chaos in our life, we tend to turn against God and say, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Why, why is this happening at, at this time? I have tried to serve you. I've done all the things that I thought were right, and now you're, you're giving me this to deal with. And we begin to, to turn against God in the midst of the valleys, which is exactly what Satan wants, because it's in the midst of the valleys that you and I need to hold on to Christ even more so. Hold on to the truths of the Word of God. Hold on to the truths that said, says He will never leave us nor forsake us. To hold on to the truths of the Sermon on the Mount that says that He gives good gifts to His children. Those are the truths that we are to hold on to in the midst of the valleys. And so this is, this is the people, these are the, the believers, and, and 1 Peter is written to the believers, and they are scattered around, wondering what's going on. Verse or Chapter 2, it says, Therefore, putting aside all of these things, you and I are to be like newborn babies. Like newborn babies long for milk, you and I are to long for the Word of God. We're to long for the Word of God. And if there's anything that is going to help us through the valleys, through the trials, through the tribulations, that is the promises in the Word of God, that we would hold on to what He has given us, and that is His Word. That is literally the truths and the promises that we have. And so he says, like newborn babies, long for, we are to long for pure milk of the word so that by it we may grow in respect to salvation. So the idea here is, is that we are uh, come to Christ as babes, as, 
people who don't really understand the Word of God, people who don't understand all the truths. We don't understand this Christianese, this Christian lingo that we have. Uh, they don't understand that. Begin to ask questions. They begin to dive into the Word of God. And it says that they grow in respect to salvation, meaning they, they grow in knowledge, this process of sanctification that they look much better today than they did last year, that they know more about God this year than they did last year, that they have drawn closer to God this year than they had last year, that the valleys aren't quite so deep and so long because our relationship with God is better than it was last year. And so then he says in verse 3, if, here's the thing, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And then he goes on to our passage uh, this evening in verse 4, and coming to him, coming to him, this is it. This is all that we need to speak about. If there's no other scripture that you have memorized at all, memorize 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and coming to him. That's all we need to know. When we go out and we share the good news of Jesus Christ, it all starts, it all ends with us coming to Jesus Christ. And not coming to Tommy, not coming to, to Bob Squared, not coming to James, not coming to Dave. No, coming to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he is the one that we need to introduce people to. And it says here in, in verse 4 that, and coming to him. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. If there's something that we need in America right now, it is rest. Rest from all of the chaos rest from all the nonsense going on. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Man, what a great passage that is for you and for me. He is gentle and he is humble. How many people do we run, in, uh, run into in Walmart that we can say they are gentle and they are humble? Not very many. Not very many. But this is the characteristics. This is the nature. This is God. That, that He is gentle and humble. Gentle and humble. John 6, uh, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. This, this uh, word here, this word uh, of coming, is, is actually a verb, and this verb means so much more than to draw close. It's actually a word uh, that, that would say that, that you and I would have an intimate, personal relationship. An intimate, personal relationship, and that prayerfully defines your relationship with our Heavenly Father. An intimate, personal relationship. Not that I, I walked an aisle, not that I, I got wet, not that at some point in my life I gave my life to Christ and I, have, uh, and I have not lived for Him since. No, that we would have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We would wake up in the morning. We would want to read the Word of God. We would want to be in communion with our Heavenly Father. That is the intimate, personal relationship that we see here. Not, not a decision that was made and then never thought about again. No, this is a change in our life from the inside out. From the inside out, the Holy Spirit just gets a grip on our life and changes us from the inside out. This is the type of intimate, personal relationship that we're talking about here in verse 4. It's the same word used in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He says, therefore, he is able also to save uh, forever, those who draw near, that's the word that looks or is the same, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So he is able to save forever those who draw near to him, have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He goes on and he says, 
I guess before I go on, uh, this is a, uh, like I said, it's ongoing communion with Jesus Christ. The work of Christian discipleship can be summed up by one word. And that one word is, is go. The work of Christian discipleship can be summed up by one word, which is go. The life of Christian discipleship can be summed up by one word, which is follow. And the beginning of Christian discipleship can be summed up by the word come. Come to him, all who are heavy laden. Then he goes on and he says, And coming to him as to a living stone. Obviously, we're speaking about Jesus Christ here. This is speaking of a, a building stone. We, we, we know it from the usage of the word, but we further understand it to be that from the passage that we see in, in, in verse 6, which is obviously reciting from Isaiah. But he says, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. So this is a, a building stone that we're talking about, a living stone. Stone. We know that he is living because the word of God tells us so. Because he conquered death. He lives forevermore. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 6, verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. Death is no longer master over him. And if you and I reside and have this intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then death no longer is a master over us. Isn't that a great, great thing to know that his conquering death, his defeating death, his power is more than sufficient to raise us from the death as well. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. That is Jesus Christ. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock of Jesus Christ. What is your cornerstone today? The cornerstone. The cornerstone is the, the stone that is laid first to make sure that everything is level. Everything comes in line with that one stone. We are all a part of that cornerstone. We are all to be perfectly aligned with that cornerstone. And prayerfully, that is Jesus Christ. That is not the world. That is not politics. That is not the things of this earth. But it is the things of heaven. It is the things of God. What is our cornerstone? What is it that you and I are focusing our life upon? You see, the Word of God here says that we are to be like newborn babies longing for pure milk, that we may grow in respect to salvation, that we may come to Him, the living stone, that we may have life and have it abundantly in Him. And then he says this, he says this in verse 4, he says, but he has been rejected by men, rejected by men. It doesn't take long after we become believers in Jesus Christ, after we have this personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, when we begin to share the good news of what he has done in our life. Prayerfully, that doesn't take long for our walk, that we begin to share that with others. And we immediately discover that not everyone is as enthusiastic about it as we are. Amen? Some have differing opinions that aren't exactly in line with what we would say would be joy, joy, joy down in their heart. Right? Uh, there's some people out there, prayerfully you've never met them, that have anything but joy. They have the, the darkness, darkness, darkness. Where? Down in their heart. Right? Prayerfully, you don't know any of those people, but as we, as we share the good news of Jesus Christ, we know that people, that men, reject him. John Phillips says that was exactly what the Jewish religious establishment had done with the Lord Jesus. They disapproved of him. They disapproved of him because he was a friend of the publicans and sinners, because he refused to bow to their Sabbath, because he scorned their oral traditions. Because the common people heard him gladly because of his miracles, especially the raising of Lazarus. 
because they did not want a mass movement in his favor that might upset the status quo with Rome, and because he exposed their hypocrisy, and because he was not the kind of Messiah they wanted anyway. They then rejected him and plotted his death. Here's the thing. Here is the thing that I love the most, that no matter what people say, No matter what the Jewish religion of the day said or did, none of that matters because Jesus Christ still went to the cross for you and for me. And he died a death for you and for me. And he conquered death that we may have everlasting life in Jesus Christ. No matter how many people reject him, the truth still remains the same. That he died that death for you and for me. And because he did that, God bestowed upon him the name above every name. That is the truth. That is the truth, no matter how many people reject, no matter if your your parents reject, your grandparents reject, your your wife, your, your spouse, it doesn't matter how many people reject. The truth never stops being the truth. That he loved you so much that he gave his one and only son to die a death for you and for me. What a day, day of rejoicing it will be when we get to leave this place and sing for thousands and thousands and thousands of years in heaven and glory with Jesus forever and ever. He goes on and he says uh, at the end of verse 5, but his choice and precious in the sight of God. No matter how many people reject Jesus, he is still the choice and the precious in the sight of God. Because he went to the cross, because he bared the shame of the cross, God bestowed upon him the name above every name, that at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No matter how many people reject, no matter how many people turn against him, it says that he is still the choice and precious stone in the sight of God. And no matter how many people reject us, no matter how many people reject us sharing the gospel, we are still the choice and precious stone in the sight of Jesus Christ. We are precious to Jesus. We are precious to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Matthew 3, 17, And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. (laughs) One day, one day, you and I will go up to heaven We will go into heaven and we will see Jesus Christ and prayerfully he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we will enter into his rest forever and ever. Oh, what a day that will be. Verse 5, he says, you also, you also as living stones, we are living stones, not because of anything that we did, not because, uh, you know, we grew up on the right side of the tracks, not because we had the right amount of money at the right time, not because we had the right friends, all because of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross for you and for me. And so he says that if we have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we too are living stones. Then it says that we are living stones that are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. We do not just worship Christ. We do not just obey Christ. We don't just pray to him. We are united with him as a spiritual building. You and I are, are united together in this thing called a spiritual building that we see here. Uh, we see it in other places that we are, uh, make up the body of Christ. Some are, some are eyes, some are feet, some are, you get the idea. But the idea here is, is that you and I are united all because of Jesus Christ. Again, not, not because of anything that we did, but all because of what 
he did. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So I tell you, no matter how alone we feel, and at times we feel alone, don't we? If we're going to be honest with one another, we, we feel alone. We feel like we're the only one walking through this particular valley at this particular time. No one knows how I feel. No one's ever been here before. I'm all alone in this big world. No one loves me, the least of which God. I'm all alone. But the Word of God says you are not all alone. You are part of a spiritual family. We are all united under the blood of Jesus Christ. We are united under the blood of Jesus Christ. Man, what a great, great word that we have this evening. We are living stones as well because of the work of Jesus Christ. We are truly being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. A priesthood. No longer do we need the high priest to enter into the Holy of Holies. The handful of the high priests that we see in the Old Testament that got to go into the Holy of Holies, no longer do we need them. We have access into the Holy of Holies. No longer do we need this dude with a white collar to intercede for you and for me, because we have access to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. We have access right to Him. It says that we are priests. We are priests. We are all priests if we are believers in Jesus Christ. Three basic characteristics of the Old Testament priesthood that have a, a great rebel, uh, 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 relevance for you and for me in this day and age, three of them, we could probably list 20. Uh, we don't have time for that, nor do you have the, the span for that, neither do I have the mental span for that. I have ADD, and so I, we're going to go with three. Three is a good number, right? So let's go with three. Uh, Exodus chapter 28, God sovereignly chose the priest. God chose the priest. God chose you. God chose you. God loves you, God wants you, God wants to be in a, in a relationship with you, God wants a friendship with you. You're not walking this world alone, you have a heavenly Father who loves you and wants to spend time with you. Even before creation was put into motion, He knew that we would sin against Him and He would have to send His one and only Son to redeem us, and yet He still breathed the first breath of life into Adam. He loves us, and He wants a relationship with us. Leviticus chapter 8, God cleansed them from their sin before they performed their duties. Leviticus chapter 8, God cleansed them before they went into action. Every part of the cleansing ceremony was to remind them and us that we must be washed by God first, that He must wash us. We see this in the New Testament, in the upper room, John 13, 5 through 8. Then He poured into the basin uh, uh, and, 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 uh, to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel with which He was girded. So He came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, Never, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And then, in, then Peter, in Peter-like fashion, right? Well, wash all of me then, right? Just, just give me all clean. I'll just take it all. And, and we, we know what happens. But, but anyways, the idea here is, is that you and I are clean, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is, there is no way that you and I are able to have access to God without the blood of Jesus Christ. 
without the blood of Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 28, God clothed the priests for service. God clothed the priest in service. You and I are clothed in righteousness. We are clothed in righteousness. Oh, man. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. You and I are clothed just like the priest. We are clothed in his righteousness in Jesus' righteousness. We are clothed in His righteousness, and it is only through that righteousness that we are able to go to God and be redeemed, redeemed, and to offer up spiritual sacrifices here in verse 5, the end of verse 5, the very last portion. He says that, that we are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What, what are these spiritual sacrifices? Well, if you remember, he's talking about the priests, and the priests of the Old Testament. What was their, one of their main functions in life was to do what? Offer sacrifices, right? That was one of their main uh, goals in life. That was one of their main jobs is that they would offer sacrifices for the people to God for their sins. Everybody good, right? No longer do we need that mediator because Jesus Christ came. He, he died the perfect death for you and for me. And therefore, we are able to offer up our own sacrifices. But no longer does he need sacrifices of animals. What he wants is, it says here in verse 5, he wants our spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices. So what does that look like? Well, uh, R.C. Linsky says this, The main task of the Old Testament priest was the offering of material animal sacrifices, all of which pointed to Christ's great sacrifice to come. These are no longer needed since Christ offered his all-sufficient sacrifice once for all. Now there remain for God's holy priesthood only the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving, seeing that all the treasures of God's grace are now poured out upon us through Christ. We see in the New Testament I see in the New Testament, I have studied and found, <laughs> you guys like all those, seven. Uh, there may be more, uh, but, but, but I have seen seven basic spiritual sacrifices that you and I are able to offer. We will not dissect each one. We will probably just dissect one, and I'll go to my conclusion. We'll be done tonight. Maybe we'll start, uh, maybe I'll dissect the rest next week if you want me to. I, I will do that. But here we go. Seven. I'm going to give you the list. Seven basic spiritual sacrifices that we are to offer God. First is our bodies. Our bodies. The second, our praise. Third, our good works. Remember, all of these we are to, to sacrifice, spiritually sacrifice to Christ. All right? Meaning that we do these things not for us, but we do these things for Christ. Okay, So that's why we say our good works. But we really understand that nothing good comes from us. The only thing good comes from Christ within us. Right? We're, we're good with that. Okay, But that's why we say our good works. Our possessions. Again, we could say we own nothing. God owns everything. But we are offering these as sacrifices to Christ. I could prove all of these in Scripture, by the way. Our converts, the ones he allows us to use, uses us to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Our love. And then lastly, our prayers. Our prayers. All of these seven acceptable spiritual sacrifices for Christians. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Folks, we are not going to find anything good and acceptable and perfect on this planet. 
It's not here to be found. It's within the believers. It's within the believers because the power of God, the Holy Spirit, resides within each and every believer. God-honoring spiritual sacrifice begins when believers offer God all their human abilities, including their minds and every part of their bodies. God-honoring spiritual sacrifice begins when we as believers offer God all of our human abilities, including our minds and every part of our bodies. Believers, our spiritual privileges begin the moment the Holy Spirit draws us into a saving faith with Jesus Christ. It's at that moment that we have access to the presence of God as priests, as priests to offer up a variety of spiritual sacrifices, which are just the essential characteristics of the Christian life. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. How is it that you and I can enter the holy of holies? It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. By a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. His flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We can come and we are able and we have the power within us to enter into the Holy of Holies any time, any place we wish through the blood of Jesus Christ. May we do that more often than we do. May He find us on our knees more often than He has. May he find us offering these spiritual sacrifices to him. I believe that that's where we will start next week, is I will finish, I will finish walking through those seven spiritual sacrifices for Christians. The first one I've already gone over, our bodies, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. May he find us faithful. May he find us faithful. Let's pray together tonight. Father, your word is alive and changing. We thank you for your word this evening. We thank you that we are living stones, that we are alive because of you, because you died the death for us, because you conquered death for us. We are alive. And I ask God that we would take an inventory of our lives this evening? Have we been living a life that says that we are priests, that we have access to the Holy of Holies, that we have access to you, our Heavenly Father? We have access to you any time that we want. And yet we find ourselves often far too busy. I ask, God, that you would continue to burden our hearts. Burden our hearts that, that your word says that we are to long for your word like newborn babies long for milk. Some of us have been longing for the word like we long for broccoli. May we devour your word. God, we thank you for this place. We thank you for this opportunity to come to this place tonight. May we glorify you in all that we do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand with me, please?